Good. So, okay, well, uh, so my presentation about is about this Green Edge project, which started uh, a few years ago and will end uh, next year. Uh, it's a project that involves about 20 different labs, um, half from Canada, half from France. There's a, there's a U.S. lab also from Stanford. Kevin Irigo is involved as well. Some Danish people as well working on seabirds. So it's a quite international um, project. It's a major effort to, uh, to study what um, the phytoplankton spring bloom in, in Arctic. Uh, so the, um, the objective is to reach a mechanistic understanding of the phytoplankton spring bloom dynamics and determine its role in the Arctic Ocean of tomorrow. So just to, uh, for those who do not know what I'm talking about when talking about a spring bloom or more generally about phytoplankton technology, uh, it's, um, it's illustrated on this slide. So if you look at the left column, uh, what you see is sea ice and under sea ice, it's the water column. So um, it's this, so the X axis is distance from the, uh, the ice edge. And the Y axis uh, shows uh, depth and different colors is, uh, show the concentration of phytoplankton with the darker ones indicating the, the largest chlorophyll concentrations. So if you look first at the left column, this is more or less the situation today where you have in May very often a spring bloom that um, takes place at the ice edge that you can see uh, observed in mostly in open waters very close to the ice edge. And uh, you get also at the same time or just before a bloom of ice algae under sea ice when snow has most, mostly uh, melted, it, uh, it started under sea ice. Then uh, when you go uh, further uh, um, in, uh, during summer in June, so this, uh, this bloom follows the ice edge and starts to, um, to get um, lower, I would say. And finally, in July, what you observe in open water is mostly a deep chlorophyll maximum, which is not, um, which you, you cannot see using satellites, and still some, some bloom at the ice edge. So we think that in the future, uh, this dynamics that I just described will significantly change because um, there is less snow on sea ice, ice is get, getting thinner, and it's getting thinner earlier in the season as well. Um, there is more leaves, more melt ponds, all, all factors that will allow phytoplankton to start blooming under sea ice rather than at the edge in open waters. And, and finally, if you go through the season, there's no time when you can see a bloom in open water. It, would, it will mostly occur under sea ice. And as um, the, uh, the breakup, uh, the ice pack will take place earlier in the season, closer to the, the sun solstice in June. Um, we will observe, we may observe larger bloom and larger bloom at higher latitudes. So the main objective of this project was, in, was indeed that the spring bloom would expand and intensify at higher latitude. At the moment, at very high latitude, we do not observe such a spring bloom simply because the ice breakup takes place in September when, uh, when um, sunlight is getting already pretty low. And because we are at very high latitude, it's the, the, uh, the sun is elevation is very low as well uh, in September. And we also, uh, the second hypothesis is that uh, this change in the phenology and in the latitude distribution of this phenology will have an impact on the structure of the trophic network. So our approach in this project was to, um, to monitor um, and to describe in great details a spring bloom in, in Arctic. Um, so you can see, and using following two approaches. Um, there's two ways you can um, look at this problem. Either sample at a fixed location and figure out what happens at different times of the year. Just um, um, so collect a time series of what's happening at a single location. Or you can go through uh, transects 
from open water to the ice edge to inside the ice pack to sea um, to document spatially the spring bloom uh, with pre-bloom conditions in the ice pack, bloom conditions at the ice edge, and post-bloom conditions in open waters. So we, we did follow these two approaches, and you will see we, we had two types of, uh, of field work. So the idea is really to document any variable of the environment, either physical or chemical or biodiversity, that uh, we need to model this event, because the ultimate goal is to be able to, to monitor properly this, this event. So we had to describe snow optics, ice optics, water optics, uh, the um, chemical composition of seawater and changes in biodiversity, essentially. What we also did, we uh, isolated some uh, typical phytoplankton species uh, at different stages of the spring bloom to uh, use them in the lab and uh, do some experiments on them to determine their, their response to light, temperature, and nutrients. Again, to get the right parameters in coupled physical biological models that would allow us to make predictions about what will happen with primer production in the Arctic. Um, one other approach that we use in this, uh, in this project is uh, remote sensing. So to look at trends over the last uh, 20 up to 35 years, if we go back to uh, CZCS, the, the first ocean color sensor. So the idea is to, um, to improve our algorithms, especially uh, during bloom conditions, to be able to, um, to derive those trends using satellites. And finally, uh, the um, last two aspects of the project is to um, use models to make predictions under different scenarios um, about what will happen with this uh, spring bloom. And also we looked at the past by collecting, collecting sediment cores and looking at how um, carbon production changed over time, over the last 2000 years uh, or more than that, uh, during warm and cold periods uh, to figure out how this spring bloom changed. Uh, we also, in addition to collecting six sediment cores, we, uh, uh, we uh, used a sclerochronology. That is, uh, we used um, bival shells to look at changes in their growth rate uh, over years and even to resolve sub um, seasonal changes in, um, in their growth, which is directly related to the amount of carbon that is produced at, uh, at the ocean surface. So the project had a number of work packages that um, mostly correspond to different aspects that I just described. So the first one is really about the bloom dynamics. Uh, second work package is about um, the food web. So we documented um, um, the transfer of energy and carbon through the uh, different levels of the food web, starting with uh, microzooplankton, mesozooplankton, macrozooplankton, fish larvae, and um, up to, to uh, seabirds. And the other work package um, are about the, the current trends, future trends, and past trends. And finally, we had uh, one last work package where we tried uh, to complement our, um, on, um, our data with, uh, with local knowledge about, uh, about the spring bloom, about uh, the fauna, as, that is associated with the spring bloom. So we interviewed um, local people. And uh, also what we did, we, we are trying to use our models to predict some, the impact on some species that are of direct interest for them because they are a part of their diets. Uh, that includes, for instance, uh, seals, um, polar, um, Arctic cods and seals. Okay, so the different field campaigns that we conducted, the first one in 2015. So uh, it was a fixed point um, sampling location. We uh, installed um, an ice camp on landfast ice uh, around a small village, which is called Titik Tajwak in Baffin Bay. We were there for four months. Uh, we started with a pretty uh, limited sampling and then with a much more intensive program uh, during the, the last two months. So we were there from March uh, 15 to July 15. 
And then in 2016, we had an ice camp again at the same place, but we started a little bit later and ended later also because the first year we kind of, uh, we did not cover the, uh, the open water phytoplankton bloom. We had to stop before. We weren't, were not prepared to work in, um, in, in conditions with uh, ice flows, pieces of ice flows and open waters, which we corrected uh, for the second year. And finally, we had the cruise on board the uh, Canadian icebreaker Amundsen during six weeks, where we had this, uh, this other strategy along transects from open waters to, uh, to the ice pack, documenting the, uh, the phytoplankton bloom. Okay, so uh, this uh, strategy is kind of uh, illustrated here. So you, what you see here is Baffin Bay. You see the ice conditions uh, during uh, around early July, I would say. And the colors uh, show a chlorophyll concentration. You can see very well the ice edge blue along the uh, ice edge. And the reason why we wanted to work in uh, Baffin Bay is that you do observe very systematically this bloom every year. You can document it um, using ocean color. So we knew that we would not miss the target, that we, we, will, we would document the spring bloom. Um, so the pink lines show um, theoretical transect from open waters to the ice pack. Uh, the star shows the uh, ice camp location, which finally was not in the middle of Baffin Bay, but rather close to the coast. Um, around here, if you see my, my uh, arrow here. And the yellow dots shows um, theoretical positions of profiling bio Argo floats that we wanted to deploy. And we also wanted to deploy um, gliders along uh, transects. Okay, the things that we documented during the uh, ice camp and the cruise are the following. So that's a kind of a quick list. So we documented the physical and optical properties of snow, sea ice, and sea water, uh, physical, uh, uh, physical oceanography of a um, number of things we did for describing the circulation and vertical mixing in the water column. Uh, we documented nutrients, concentration, assimilation rates as well, primer production, diversity of phytoplankton, bacteria, but also of zooplankton, of benthas, of uh, fish and seabirds. Uh, we measured vertical fluxes use, using uh, of carbon, using uh, um, a diversity of uh, devices. And finally, we, uh, we sampled bottom sediments either for paleoceanography paleo or for uh, biological activity. So on this sketch, you see the uh, uh, summary of the different devices that we deployed from the ice camp uh, with a number of uh, automatic samplers on, on sea ice to document snow and and, and, and sea ice, we had uh, thermistors, for instance, in sea ice also to have temperature profiles and uh, sea ice thickness as well uh, continuously. We deployed ROVs to document light very uh, in great details under sea ice at different times of the season, nets, and a number of imagers to uh, sample diversity in phytoplankton and zooplankton, and a number of physical sensors. And this is the same sketch for the cruise. Here, what we have uh, in addition is gliders. We also towed an, an MVP to have the, uh, at high resolution, the physical conditions al along the transects we, uh, we went through. Um, what else? Yeah, okay. And you have the bio argo flows as well. Okay, so this is the, the position of, um, of the ice camp, finally, which was located south of uh, an island where the village, the Kiki Tarjwak village is located. Uh, this was an ideal place because the island protected um, the, 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 the ice camp from icebergs. We were uh, on, on, on landfast ice, very stable, and uh, above pretty deep water, 400 meters deep, very close to the coast, but 400 meters deep with no terrestrial signal, no freshwater signal. Um, if you look at a TS diagram measured there and compare it with um, one that was uh, measured um, at the shelf break, you see pretty much the same thing. 
So we got open um, offshore conditions while located very close to the coast. It was very convenient because we were all living uh, in Kikik Tajwak and had labs as well in this village. So you can see a few pictures of our installations uh, here with few um, with um, um, a tent uh, from where we deployed a number of uh, devices, uh, either uh, um, a rosette, uh, Niskin bottles for collecting waters, but also many different sensors to measure optics and to uh, images for diversity as well. Um, a number, all the analysis were, um, uh, were made in the tent when we could not wait for a few hours to bring the, the samples in the village to analyze them. Uh, this is a summary of the different devices that we deployed from the tent. Uh, you see here, for instance, this is a Loki here, lower left. It's an imager uh, that takes uh, images of particles that are collected by a net and concentrated by this net. It provides very high resolution images that allows you to do pretty uh, fine uh, taxonomy and to distinguish as well uh, the different uh, life. Um, uh, different uh, life not stages of uh, some of uh, those zooplankton species. Um, you can see here, for instance, this is an optical package to uh, document uh, the absorption coefficient, scattering coefficient as well. Okay. And these are, these are some of the devices that we uh, deployed um, on sea ice. Okay, now the crews. So what you see in this picture is the actual sampling, um, the stations that were actually visited. So what you see in black and gray is sea ice around July 1st, and each dot shows a station. So we, uh, we, were, we covered uh, a num uh, finally a total number of 200 stations. Um, so with, at some stations, some minimal measurements for the physics and some other with a full set of variables measured and, and water samples collected. You can see again, so you can see these transects that go from open water to inside the ice pack. There's, uh, there's uh, seven, seven transects that were covered. Just um, a brief, um, so I can show you quickly some of the data just to, to show you the, the conditions that we encountered um, over such transects. I show three of those transects. So on left, you can see temperature, and on the right, you can see salinity. Uh, you must know that in Baffin Bay, you have a current that goes north, uh, which is made of Atlantic water, pretty uh, warmer, saltier uh, Atlantic water. And on the, um, the west part of Baffin Bay, you have a current that comes, comes from the north with um, more typical Arctic water, which are fresher and colder. And this is the setup that, um, that uh, creates this, this retreat of sea ice from east to west rather than from south to north. And it's, it's, very, it's what you observe very systematically um, every year. So you can see uh, what I just described on the temperature plot with cold water on the left, warmer water on the right, and uh, with salinity with saltier water and on the uh, east side and uh, fresher water on the, uh, on the west side. And what you can see on these plots is that for every transect, we pretty much observe, observe the, the same thing. It's very reproducible in terms of conditions. Uh, what you see on this other plot is of uh, in vivo fluorescence, so an index of phytoplankton uh, concentration. So the first section was kind of atypical. It was not like the other ones, but the section 200 and 300 and the remaining of the transects looked look much more uh, like um, the 200, 200 and uh, 300 transects. So if you look um, on, the, on the west part, so you have no bloom. We, we were mostly in pre-bloom conditions in section 200. In section 300, we were starting to have a bloom under sea ice. Uh, so the ice edge was located about uh, 59 degrees west. Uh, and this is where we observe maximum biomass right at the surface. And um, we were in the ship, so we could see that the bloom, in fact, systematically 
was starting under sea ice and not in open water at the ice edge. And when getting uh, further from the ice edge, so uh, eastward, the uh, maximum uh, biomass um, goes deeper uh, because the, uh, the nutrients get exhausted at surface. So phytoplankton can only grow deeper and um, deeper and deeper. And you will see, you will, you will see, I will show you uh, bioarga floats later, and you, you will see what happens later during summer and even during fall. And this is, uh, these sections show uh, the distribution of nutrients. So from zero to 200 meters along such transects. So you can see that uh, where we observe post bloom conditions, indeed nitrate were uh, totally exhausted in the surface layer. Okay, now I will focus uh, the rest of my talk on the data we collected with the bio argoflutes. And I will go into more details. So those bio Argo floats, um, so I, I guess most people know about the Argo program where you have these drifting floats that go from two, zero to 200 meters every 10 days and collect temperature and salinity data. And they do transmit those data uh, using um, iridium telemetry uh, to, to land. Um, it's a very operational network of, uh, of floats. Uh, that now uh, is expanding in terms of complexity of the, uh, of the platforms. There are now what we call bio Argo floats. They are the same floats, but they carry more sensors to document biogeochemistry. And most of these sensors are optical sensors that measure um, chlorophyll fluorescence, organic matter fluorescence, particle backscattering to get an idea of, uh, of the particle load nitrate, oxygen concentration as well, and finally uh, downward irradiance, in addition to uh, temperature and salinity and depth. So what you see on the left is um, drawing of such a float that we are using, which was modified to be used in Arctic with a cage that protects uh, some of the, the sensors. And also we added an altimeter to detect the presence of icebergs and some LIDAR also to detect the presence of sea ice. So that the floats were deployed um, around July 50, uh, 20th during the cruise. We deployed four floats. You can see on the map their trajectory from uh, mid-July to the end of October. Uh, they went from zero to 1,000 meters. They always parked at 1,000 meters and collected, collected one profile per day. So they really worked at high frequency. And because the currents are very slow, deeper, they didn't move so much. And now they have spent the whole winter there and we are waiting for them to, uh, to come back to the surface when the ice pack will, will be totally melted. And hopefully uh, it will, <laughs> we will see them again. But at least they uh, provide us with uh, about 100 profiles, which, which are very interesting. So you see here uh, the time series of salinity from zero to 100 meters from, uh, mid -July, uh, from July 9th, in fact, to the end of October with one profile per day, except in October where we switch to one profile every third day. Uh, so what you see here is uh, simply some, so uh, salinity, which uh, kind of uh, so increases with time. They mostly worked, I would say, like uh, Lagrangian floats. We do not think that they, uh, they, we think that they remain in the same water mass, except for this float here, uh, the 13B, where you see this event in the middle, which is um, probably, uh, it entered some eddy, or we don't know what at the moment, but this one probably uh, didn't work as a Lag Lagrangian float. Okay, so uh, what you can see here uh, that, that is uh, interesting is um, this, this here at the end of the time series in, uh, in uh, October, we see what looks like a mixing event with some uh, increase of salinity at the surface. I will talk more about this possible mixing event during September. So with the float, we not only covered the spring bloom in open water, but also the, the fall bloom. Uh, we did not cover the under-ice phytoplankton bloom because we didn't want to deploy the floats under sea ice. 
So we have part of the story with this, these floats. So there's a number of lines on, the, on these plots. Let me explain what they are. So the dashed line here is the depth of the mixed layer. Uh, so the, uh, the, uh, this dashed line with squares here is the depth of the euphotic zone, which is uh, the depth where you get 1% of incident irradiance. And the fold line, which is a very interesting one, is the depth of, the, of some isolum. Uh, an isolum is depth where you get some constant daily irradiance. So this isolum shows the depth where you get 0.4, um, mole of, quant of photons per day. Uh, based on some, on, on some uh, on literature, it pretty much corresponds to the maximum depth with phyto where phytoplankton can grow. Uh, so it's a different metrics compared with the euphotic zone because it's in absolute units. It accounts for the amount of the actual amount of light that is available for phytoplankton rather than the euphotic zone, which provides some uh, relative amount of light. So it's 1% of irradiance, of surface irradiance. Okay, now let's look at uh, temperature. So if you look at the upper left, for instance, you, so you see that the uh, surface water gets warmer uh, during um, um, to some maximum temperature at the end of August. And then you see some cooling um, in, uh, during uh, uh, September and especially October, and at the end of October, a, a significant cooling of the uh, of the surface water, which would be consistent with some uh, mixing event. What you see also is um, is deepening of the mixed layer, which is very significant during uh, this uh, this period. Okay. What you see also is this sh uh, shoaling of the uh, the isolum which is consistent with the fact uh, that uh, sunlight incident irradiance gets lower during, uh, during fall. Okay, now let's look at uh, biomass um, over those time series. So this is chlorophyll fluorescence. Uh, and uh, those time series su suggest, you, have, you can see two of them here. If you look at the left one, they suggest that when we started uh, on July 9th, we already had a deep, a subsurface chlorophyll maximum, no more biomass at surface. And this kind of got deeper uh, at the end of August. And then uh, it, uh, the, this um, maxima, uh, biomass maximum uh, went um, shallower at the end of the time series up to the surface. You could, we could observe some um, increase in biomass at the surface. And you see how nicely at some point this uh, maximum biomass follows the isolum during most of the time series here. You can see how significant this uh, isolum is to drive uh, phytoplankton uh, growth. Now, if you look at particles instead of chlorophyll fluorescence, and the reason for doing that is that chlorophyll fluorescence, as you probably know, is, um, is not such a good uh, index of biomass because it experiences at surface some inhibition. And also because uh, at, um, deeper, it, it, uh, it experienced some increase due to photoacclimation, which results in an increase in uh, the amount of chlorophyll per cells, while carbon may not be higher. And uh, given that this, this, um, this site is not affected by terrestrial particles, um, this, this time series in, in the scattering coefficient mostly um, reflects the changes in particulate organic carbon. So what you see on those time series is that, in fact, at the, on July uh, 9th and during the following weeks, weeks, we did have a bloom at surface in open waters. And then it went deeper, very nicely deeper, uh, to um, maximum depth. Uh, at the end of August, and then the maximum biomass um, layer went up to the surface. You can see the color here uh, during October. It does increase at surface, and uh, yeah. So we did. So on those time series, we do document a spring bloom and a fall bloom, and in the middle, uh, a deep chlorophyll maximum. So we do 
describe very well this phonology at high frequency uh, with not all the variables we need, but uh, with, with, with great details on some variables. And finally, this is uh, the nitrate time series. So nitrate is measured using an in-situ spectrophotometer that measures nitrate absorption in the UV. And you can see that uh, indeed uh, nitrate um, were, uh, if you look at the right panel, lower right, you can see that they were probably high enough to support phytoplankton growth at surface at the beginning of the time series. And then the nitrocline uh, got deeper, which is consistent. And we, um, we, you can see, um, if you look at the last profile, at the end of October, you do see these increase, uh, uh, an in a significant increase in nitrate concentration at surface, uh, which is consistent with a possible mixing event. Okay, so um, we have these two variables that seem uh, important, this isolum depth and, and all of this isolum and also this, uh, the mixing event that in driving this phenology that you, I just showed. The isolum depth depends on two things. It depends on incident irradiance, the amount of uh, incident, uh, so incident irradiance, and it depends also on light attenuation in the water column. So if you have clouds, the, the isolum will get shallower. If you, um, if you have a lot of biomass that attenuate light in the water column, the isolum will also get shallower. So the question here we wanted to uh, answer is what, what, what was driving this isolum? At li light attenuation in the water column or incident irradiance? So if you look at um, the, the upper right panel, what you can see in blue is incident irradiance during the time series, and in black, the isolum depth. And you can see that, especially in the end, it's to a large extent driven by incident irradiance. And here, it's not clouds, it's mostly driven by the, uh, simply by the decrease in sun elevation and decrease in the, in the day length, day length as well during fall. But you see also some high frequency changes that could be due to clouds. Uh, they are common to the two curves and they are certainly due to clouds, these high frequency uh, variations. If you look at the bottom left panel, there you can see uh, in orange, what you see is one over KD. So uh, the larger it is, the, uh, the lower is attenuation in the water column. Okay, and you can see that uh, during some period, like here in the middle of the time series, for instance, these changes are really driven by changes in the biomass uh, in the water column and attenuation and not by incident irradiance. Okay, um, yeah, that's the same thing. Now, a few words about this mixing event. So mixing could be due to uh, uh, during fall to, uh, to wind stress, or, uh, or it could be due to convection uh, when it's cooling at the surface. Uh, there, there could be density anomalies. So we looked at some data to figure out whether um, it, it was possible, it could possibly happen. So we looked at some uh, wind data from satellites, from reanalysis um, re data sets, in fact. Um, and what you see, can see here is uh, uh, um, so wind speed at surface and, and also uh, wind stress, which accounts for, for the drag at the surface ocean. And indeed, uh, both are maximum during October, very significantly um, higher in October. Now, if we look at the possibility of convection, we looked at different components of the heat flux at surface, unfortunately, Unfortunately, on this graph, I do not have the sum, only the individual components, but I can tell you that at the end of the time series, um, we do have uh, the heat flux get significantly negative during that time when we had uh, some vertical mixing. So we now need to figure out through calculations uh, what was the, uh, the most important drivers or maybe both were uh, important to drive this mixing. Okay, so this last slide just shows a summary of these uh, results about 
about phenology. And um, I wanted to show you the data to, uh, to show how uh, powerful these, uh, these profiling floats are to uh, collect this kind of, of uh, high frequency, high vertical resolution data sets. And what we uh, intend to do now is to try to reproduce those data using a 1D model uh, by, of course, adjusting the parameters, either uh, based on uh, the data we collected from the ship or from the ice camp, and also just to, um, we will do, of course, some tuning of the parameters. And then uh, I guess we will have a good 1D model for, uh, for uh, make, make it doing predictions and later in the frame of a 3D model. And that's it for now. So um, there's much more. Uh, to come soon. In the coming year, we intend to uh, publish a special issue from Greenwich and uh, to show uh, all of the data. Thank you. So much, so much Marcel. Um, um, we have time for maybe questions. We do have two other speakers today. So um, does anyone on the line have a, a quick question or two for Marcel? I've got a quick question. Um, so I was at, earlier in the talk, you said that you had um, documented phytoplankton and bacteria diversity. And I may have missed how, um, how do you went about doing that? Uh, um, someone can repeat the I didn't hear very clearly. The question was, you talked about bacteria, I think. Uh, yes, you um, earlier in the talk, I, I thought I had saw on one of your slides that you had documented diversity of phytoplankton and bacteria in yeah, the water. Yeah, yes. Yeah, I didn't. Um, so how did was, you go about uh, the bacteria specifically? Yeah, so there were uh, first some close itometry measurements uh, conducted and then a lot of molecular biology analysis conducted. Um, by uh, Connie Lovejoy on one hand at Laval University, some people from France, Daniel Bolo for phytoplankton, and some people from Banyuls for bacteria. So this, there, there were a lot of, uh, of samples collected for molecular biology for, so for, uh, you okay. know. Great. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I had a question on the um, extent of the moon under the ice in, in the beginning of the year in May, um, why does it not extend all the way out to the ice edge in your models? So can you repeat the question? I got some words, but not all of them. Oh, in, in, the, um, in your, the initial set of diagrams that you showed, you had the um, ice, uh, the, uh, the bloom occurring at the ice edge in May whereas in the future you were predicting that the bloom would be further under the ice. Why would it not extend all the way to the ice edge? So into under, why it would extend under sea ice? Why would it extend from under the sea ice all the way to the ice edge? Why would it not extend all the way out? Oh, open because, water? Uh, because the, the, the nutrients get exhausted before, before the blooms just, what may happen and what certainly, certainly already happens in some regions, in some cases, is that you do um, go through uh, the pre-bloom, bloom, and post-bloom conditions all under the sea ice. And uh, the nutrients uh, in the first 10 of meters get exhausted because before the, uh, the ice completely melts. Mm, okay. Yeah, and this is such a stratified system that vertical mixing um, is, is pretty weak. So as soon as the surface nutrients get exhausted, they are not um, renewed until fall when you mm -hmm. get uh, these fall blooms. So the fall bloom uh, event is, is, is very important one. It's not so much because it does produce a lot of biomass for the food web, but rather because uh, what it shows is that vertical mixing can happen during the summer and can bring additional nutrients at surface uh, that add to what is uh, brought by uh, during um, 
the winter con uh, aline, aline convection. And uh, I think this, 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 this is a big question for related to primary production, whether uh, the annual budget for primary production is simply limited by the amount of nutrients brought to the surface during winter and whatever happens afterward, even if you have more light, um, there won't be any additional primary production. Um, well, what we show with these fall blooms is that no, well, if the uh, ocean is more exposed to the atmosphere, um, there may be some wind-driven and convection, thermal convection-driven vertical mixing that will support um, more production. 